So just a bit of a recap on what the urban and rural water strategy is. It's a 50 year outlook about projected water supply and demand across all our water sources, all our water supply systems. And it's actually a key feed into gin and water's pricing submission. Because if we project that there might be a shortfall in supply at some point in that 50 year period, and we need to make changes, we need to invest in some new supply infrastructure, new supply sources, that potentially flows through to pricing impacts at a point in time. And if that's expected to be in the next five years, obviously that's a conversation that we need to be having with our customers. So that's why it's such an integral part of our feed-in and pricing submission process. But the reason we do this water strategy, it's a requirement from the Minister for Water. But even if we didn't have that requirement, we would still need to do that as a water corporation. We still need to look ahead, we still need to plan to make sure that our supply and demand will remain in balance uh, well into the future. So how we break down this strategy and how we look at it, we do it by individual supply system or supply sources. So one of our largest geographic supply systems is service from the Grampians Reservoirs. So that's the Wimmera Mallee pipeline in the orange outline. We've also got, uh, that's fed from the Grampians Reservoirs down here. East Grampians pipeline coming online in the future and southwest modern to the west, which can be supplied from the Grampians uh, and has been this year. We also have our Murray and Goldman supplied systems, so in the Northern Mallee area, Township of Wampatork and also the Southwest Lodden Pipeline in part. Our Eastern Grampians urban systems down to the south of Ararat, so uh, Moist and Lake Bolac, Whitcliffe, uh, down that way. And also our groundwater towns, which are all over in the western part of our region. So they are the four supply system categories that we use for our water strategy. So what this strategy actually involves is looking at historic water demands and analysing those for each of our 72 towns, for each of our supply systems, and then also looking at water supply and water availability, modelling and forecasting for 50 years into the future. So then we put those supply and demand forecasts together to understand where we might have supply shortages in the future, at what point in time we may need to look at investing in infrastructure uh, or other measures to make sure we've got that supply demand balance right. One of the key things for our 2022 strategy is a focus on the post-1997 climate for our Grampians reservoirs. And that's what I've got up on this slide in the uh, red box there, just highlighting the difference in the inflow pattern since 1997. And there's a red line there that's showing the average inflow since 1997. Um, and comparing that to the 24, 25 years prior to 1997. Uh, so, Orange box is showing the period after 1975, red box is showing the period after 1997. So they're the two recent periods that are recommended for use in planning as being more reflective of the climate that we may see going forward into the future. The thing is in our region since 1997, that decline in observed reservoir inflows has been 58%, so 58% below the average. So we put a focus on that um, on the basis that if we do continue under that dry climate, that obviously means we're not going to see uh, a great increase in water availability. If our demands are increasing, that means that things may get tighter at a point in future. So that's been a key thing in the back of our mind and a key consideration in putting that strategy together. But we also consider a full range of climate scenarios from a return to historic climate from conditions if we return to post-1975 average, right through to a range of climate impact scenarios. So we'll see that on a slide uh, in a few minutes' time. But the key findings for, for our Grampian supply system is that even under a dry climate post-1997 conditions, under our current level of demand and what we project to occur over the next 50 years with urban and rural system growth, and that's including the East Grampians pipeline, demand is really, really secure. 
we're projecting that we could meet demand in effectively 100% of years. So we don't expect there to be a shortage under that type of scenario. So when we look at that graphically, we see this great big blue wedge. That's our projected water availability under a full range of scenarios. There's a dashed black line on that, which is our estimated likely water availability. So that's what we estimate our water availability might track like under post-1997 conditions and if we saw a bit more reduction from climate change into the future. We don't know if that would happen, but it's an estimated scenario. Red line across that chart is what we project our water demand to be over the next 50 years. And there's a grey band either side of that that represents low demand to high demand. So our demand fluctuates year to year in line with seasonal conditions, where the year's demand is lower, hotter, dry year's demand is higher. So that's the band of fluctuation that we would generally see. So for the people in the room, sorry, people online won't be able to see me pointing, where our red projected demand line overlaps with our blue or availability line, that's where we project that there may be supply for the short demand. So under this scenario, that only happens if we see high impact climate change. If we see post-1975 conditions return, which is the top of that blue line, if we see this estimated likely um, scenario, the dashed black line under post-1997 conditions continue, the red demand line and the availability never overlap. So that means we're always projecting to have more supply than we will demand over that period. The key factor that will change that is major industrial customers coming online. Might have felt I had those labels on there earlier. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we also looked at a high demand scenario. So this is if those major customers come online um, in this region, there's some mineral sands mining companies, they don't use their water, they're not operating yet, but they do hold that water entitlement. And because of those users not taking their entitlement because they haven't needed it, that's really buffered the climate related impacts to Geo Waters urban and rural supplies. So those climate impacts from historic climate through to what we're seeing post-1997, that 58% reduction, the impact is really being buffered by these major customers not taking their water allocations and then sitting in storage and supporting our other customers. So if we model what happens if those users take all the water they're allocated in every single year, and this is a hypothetical scenario because we don't know if it will happen, we don't know when it may happen, but we want to see what a worst case might be. So that did transpire. Obviously, our range of water availability shifts down from what you see on that last line because we don't have that surplus water from those industrial customers um, sitting in storage. But we see that our projected demand overlaps our expected availability a lot earlier. So what that means is that if that scenario played out, we could expect we may need to make some investment under this projection, maybe around 2035, to make sure we've still got enough supply to meet demand. So this is all a really important part of our plan to test these different scenarios, to understand the sensitivity or level of sensitivity uh, from current base case to what might happen at a point in time in the future. But this is really highlighting the, the sensitivity from our urban and rural demand customers mm -hmm. and the changes there, which is not projected to be very, very great. So you can only see a very, very gradual increase in that red uh, demand line. But if those industrial customers kick in and take a lot of water all at once, that's where the impact is. So that's one of the factors that is likely to drive our need to invest in new water supply infrastructure um, to seek out new water supply sources. But because we're not expecting that supply demand balance to be an issue within the next five years, we've got an action in our strategy which is to actually investigate a range of possible actions. So we've got some concepts, some of those have been investigated in quite a bit of detail, like the Rocklands Reservoir to Taylor's Lake Pipeline. But there are other ideas and concepts that we do have, but we're proposing that we'll investigate those, we'll feasibility test them, we'll cost them, so that when we're coming into our next water strategy, our next pricing submission, 
if we have better clarity on when we might need to deliver some of those options, we understand the costs, we can have a conversation with yourselves as customers and stakeholders about what that means if there is a pricing impact to customers. So at the moment, we don't know when that may be, but we do not expect it to be in the next five years. So in the short to medium term, rural pipeline and urban growth is going to be the primary driver of new demand in the Grampian system, other than the East Grampian's rural pipeline. So in terms of urban centres, Horsham Store, Ararat, those larger urban centres are projected to grow in population, so that's on state um, population projections. So as you might expect, if population is growing, we expect that water demand will also increase in, um, in parallel. But that is not the biggest impact to our water security. It really is those industrial customers taking supply if they do take all of their supply all at the same time. So that's something that we've got in mind and it's not just going to happen tomorrow. We will have some forward understanding of when that will start to occur so we can plan and manage that into the future. So as I mentioned, we've got an action in our strategy to do some of those investigations and studies looking at a whole range of things, uh, water saving options, but also potential connections to other water sources that we already use in the case of the Warringah Channel and Murray system, uh, potentially looking at op opportunities for groundwater su to supplement supply, uh, these are all hypothetical, they're all conceptual, that's why we're proposing that we'll do some detailed studies, investigations, understand are they feasible, what are the costs, are there other options, um, are there other opportunities that are better than what we've come up with to date. So that's our work uh, for the next five years to, to do that so we can come back to these forums ahead of our 2027 water strategy and be able to talk through, these are the options, this is what we think is the most feasible, this is what the costs may look like. Um, and if at that point in time, we may know when the delivery of them is looking more likely. The other key thing to keep in mind is a lot of this is based on drier climatic conditions. If we do flip into a more favorable cycle for a decade or two, then any of these augmentation options um, need to improve supply that becomes further and further into the future, more and more distant. So we're planning an effect on worst case, but it may not be what transpires. We may actually get better inflows, a uh, better scenario over the next 5, 10, 50 years. Um, so that's why we're planning that really broad range of water availability. We're looking at everything from return to historic, return to wetter conditions, right through to that high impact climate change and massive reduction in water availability. One of the other key findings we've had is for our Lake Orchard system, so that supplies portion that mark supply system six of our uh, rural system, which is around the Wartook Valley. Our modelling showed that Lake Wartook's at a higher risk than the overall Grampians reservoir system. That's because it's not um, connected to other parts of the network in terms of we can't service uh, portion from Lake Belfield, from Taylor's Lake, from other parts of the network and because of that, the size of that storage relative to the volume of demand from it, so that's both from urban, rural and environmental supply, it's got a high demand to volume capacity ratio. So that means it's not as secure as other parts of the system where the volume of demand is lower relative to the capacity of the storage supplying that demand. So as part of our strategy, we're proposing to look at some assessments for long-term supply improvements for Horsham and Supply System 6. So if at a point in time we did need to do some work to make sure that those systems have the same level of security as our broader Wimmera Mallee pipeline, we know what they look like, we know what the costs will be, and we're also proposing to look, work with other bulk entitlement holders and bulk entitlement stakeholders to make sure that the water sharing arrangements around Lake Water make sure that everyone's getting their fair share, everyone understands what they've got access to each year, um, which makes it a lot easier for both ourselves and for environmental water managers to plan um, their water use for the year. <coughs> Stepping right across to the northern part of our system, our Murray and Golden supplied uh, system findings, again, they are very, very secure. 
So under post-1975 climate, post-1997 climate, we're projecting that if we didn't carry over any unused water in reserve each year, we'd be servicing those demands without problem in 94 to 98% of years. If we bring in to the play our carryover reserves, so that's what we don't use uh, in one year, we roll forward to this following year. We're projecting that even under um, post-1997 climate, low impact climate change, we're still able to meet demands in those systems in 100% of years. And what that's shown us is our current practice of maintaining water and reserve year to year is really, really important to buffer those dry years that we get um, every now and then, and making sure we've always got enough water in the bank to make sure we can supply those systems. So the security of supply at the lower allocation years is dependent on those reserves, and it's been a really successful strategy uh, over the past you know, decade that we've really been uh, I guess implementing that sort of balancing of supply and demand through dry conditions. So because of that importance of carryover and some changes in how the Northern Victorian river systems work in terms of uh, trading rules limits which affect how we can move water between our accounts, we've got an action in our strategy to just review how we managed our carryover, how we managed the movement of water between our um, water bank accounts to make sure that that still fits our requirements and it still works with those changes to Northern Victoria rules. So we don't expect much change, but it's always worth checking that our strategy and our approach is going to meet our needs. For our groundwater towns, because of the sheer extent of groundwater resources across most of those areas, the security of supply is really, really good. The one exception, and I'm sure we've talked about this in the past, is Eden Hope Township, and that's because it's supplied from a highly localised pocket of good quality, low salinity groundwater. And it's always been acknowledged as a finite resource from water quality, um, from a water quality perspective, and that's because it's surrounded by more saline water. And what we've seen over the last five years is one of our production bores has started to exhibit a gradually increasing trend in salinity. So that might be indicating that that saline water is starting to get closer to our production bores. So the lifespan of um, that ore field might be getting towards its end. So we've proposed that we need to keep monitoring our Eden Hope ore field as we currently do and that we need to do another technical assessment to try and understand how much longer can we rely on that ball field. Um, chances are it will see us through five years or more, but we need to really understand um, you know, when we need to invest to either manage supply and manage quality or bring water in from somewhere else. So we're proposing that we'll start doing that work over the next five years so we understand when we need to do something um, for in hope supply, what that's going to be, um, and we can discuss that with our customers and stakeholders. Our Eastern Grampians urban system, so that's around that um, Laura Lake, Bolak, Moiston area. Uh, the Eastern Grampians pipeline will connect into most of those towns for Moiston, that's looking like um, an upgrade to drinking water. And because of those connections to Grampian supplied systems, it means that the security of supply in those systems won't be less than the Grampian's reservoir system. So on our future projections of current demand, that's looking at effectively near 100% security. So because the East Grampian's pipeline hasn't been built yet, we don't know exactly how those connections will operate, um, where they'll sit, how we can move water around those systems. We've said that there's not really a need to do a really detailed assessment right now for these supply systems, but we'll do that at our next water strategy point in time, so 2027. And that's because we know once those towns are connected to the new pipeline, they will have uh, really good water security, and we can then more properly assess the operational side of that um, ahead of our next strategy once it's all built. So that's a really quick high level summary of our water strategy. Uh, probably around 18 months of work bundled up in quite a short presentation. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, if there's anything you'd like clarification on, please feel free to ask. Ken, Tony West, I'm from London from the panel. Um, just a question in regards to storages and so on. 
um, they're prone from time to time to develop very green algae and, and those sorts of issues. Uh, I was just wondering what strategies, uh, aside from the testing and so on, I know the water supplies are monitored and so on, but in the event of something happening, um, well, Lake Bolick, I think, believe, have an issue. Um, we have a minor issue out um, in, in Elmhurst, where I am. Um, I'm wondering if we are, one of our major storages was affected, um, and we don't really have any control. I mean, blueberry and algae, it's, you know, the bird life, the, the weed growth, and all those other sort of issues. How, what, what strategies have we got in place to deal with that? Yeah, it's a really good question about blue-green algae uh, in our major storages and in our water strategy we actually look at the risk of blue-green algae affecting supply but also bushfires and other factors impacting water in our major reservoirs and major water sources. So some of the options we have uh, with our Grampians reservoir system because it's so interconnected for the Wimmera Valley pipeline um, as we've done in the past when Lake Belfry was affected following bushfires and floods we can draw water from Taylor's Lake uh, in the Northern Mallee systems, we've got cross connections which allow us to pump water that's good quality around from storages in the system, uh, move water between those pipeline networks. We've also got a pilot project up at Oyen to look at filtering water coming off the Murray. So in the event of things like BGA, that becomes um, filtered out of the water before it goes through our networks. So there's a number of things that are actually in place now but there's also things that we are doing in progress um, and improvements and upgrades that we're proposing into the future to continue to manage those risks of blue-green algae and impacts to water quality in reservoirs uh, and the river systems that we take our urban water supplies from. Thank you.